Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you're going to hear this message, we hope that you'll come and visit with us someday. This is a message to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, to edify the saints. It's about edification and holiness and righteousness. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servant of corruption, of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in the bondage. Let's open a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your blessings. And we thank you for your truth. Father, I pray now that you'd edify your people, that you'd help us to grow and be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have a spirit today in the world. That spirit is uh, in the church. Uh, what's sad to say is the culture is affecting the church rather than the church to culture. And perhaps the reason for it is, is the church is not preaching on godliness and holiness and righteousness enough. Uh, we should be affecting the culture and changing the culture. We shouldn't be letting the culture corrupt us. But you have in the, the spirit in the church today where they speak of liberty. And yes, doctrinally, this is correct and true. When you uh, have all your sins forgiven, your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins, you, by reality of God's amazing grace, are at liberty. Uh, there's nothing that you can do that would send you to hell once you've been truly born again and forgiven because God's grace is sufficient and God, who cannot lie, has promised you good when you repent of your sins and trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. However, that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is to go and sin no more. The Spirit of God is to take up the cross and crucify the flesh and to try to live godly. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. See, Paul is preaching to us in the Holy Spirit and his prayer to God is that we don't do any evil. Not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest though we be as reprobates. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And this also we wish, even your perfection. You see, Paul was looking for the edification of the Christians that had repented of their sins and trust Christ as their Savior, and he was looking for their perfection in Christ. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification and not to destruction. Now edification is a building up of people in a moral and a biblical sense. It is instruction, improvement, progress of the mind, in knowledge, in morals, or in faith and holiness. I would like to bring your attention today to a greater understanding of the Ten Commandments in a right and moral context to further your walk in the Spirit. As newborn Christians or as Christians of age, we are to walk in the Spirit that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's not required that you know all 613 commandments. It's not even necessary that you read the Bible, but both of these things you should do. You should learn all of God's commandments. You should read your Bible daily. No, it's very easy to understand righteousness and how to determine righteousness. The Apostle Paul, by revelation of the Holy Spirit, made it abundantly clear that the law cannot justify us in regards of our soul's salvation. Now, before we proceed, it's important that you need to understand that you can only be saved by faith through grace. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Many people are trying in some meager attempt to keep in, in, in the law or they develop their own set of moral standards. They believe if they can achieve or obtain to these that they'll be all right with God. 
And the Bible is very clear. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there is none righteous, no, not one. You violated God's holiness. You will violate God's holiness. Therefore, there needs to be a repentance and a faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the propitiation for your sins, who never violated the law and kept it in all 613 points. But I'm not going to make life difficult for you. There's a very easy way to walk in the Spirit and to know if you're being right with God and if you're following the righteousness, not the letter, but the righteousness of the law. However, though the Apostle Paul, as we, are saved and justified by grace through faith, the Apostle of the grace of God kept himself in a Spirit-led walk that kept him under the law of Christ. You see, there's a law of Christ that a lot of Christians are not aware of, perhaps because they're not reading their Bible and therefore they're ignorant of a lot of truths. Paul said to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. And I'm going to show you the law to Christ, and then I'm going to take you through the love and the godliness of the first ten commandments that are fulfilled in the law of Christ that represent all the righteousness of all 613 commandments and all of God's righteousness that I might gain them throughout the law. The law of Jesus Christ is given in Matthew in the spirit and not the letter and it's very simple. Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there eat. Very easy to do wrong. You don't have to have courses to teach people how to do wrong or how to sin. People learn to do that naturally. You have to have church to teach people how to live right, how to live holy. You have to have preaching and teaching to exhort people to crucify the flesh. Now, it's very easy for any man, woman, or child on the planet to understand the righteousness of the law. Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so them. It's that simple. The rule of divine justice in Jesus Christ is laid down. Whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Jesus Christ came to teach us not only what we are to know and believe, that's salvation by faith, by putting your trust in Christ, the message of the gospel, but what we are to do, how to walk in the spirit and live as a Christian. What we are to do not only toward God, it teaches us how to have reverence and respect and faith and hope towards God, but also towards our fellow man. Not only towards our fellow disciples, those of our party and persuasion, but towards all men in general, with all whom, whom we have to do. Yes, we are and can only be saved by grace, but as trophies of his grace, we are to walk in the good works of the spirit of godliness and righteousness, and this is the edification to that. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that now of yourselves is a gift of God, eternal life is a gift from God to people that cannot achieve the mastery of walking in the Spirit and always obeying the Spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Therefore, the law can only be but a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, to show us our need of redemption and to show us our need to put our faith in Christ and then to put on Christ who fulfilled all the law. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God has ordained that those who are saved and redeemed should walk in the righteousness in the law. Now, there's in the church today some contrary teachings. If any man teach otherwise, he consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. What is the meaning of this rule? It lies in three things. We must do that to our neighbor, 
which we ourselves acknowledge to be fit and reasonable. The appeal is made to our own judgment, and the discovery of our own judgment is referred to that which is our own will and expectation when it is our own cause. Any individual can know what's right to do by simply being honest and determining what you would have done unto you. If that's what you would have done unto you in any circumstance or case, then don't do anything but that to someone else. We must put other people upon the level with ourselves and reckon we are as much obliged to them as they are to us. Now, in a selfish, self-centered, self-glorifying society, most people are only worried about what people do to them. They never even think or consider what they're doing to other people. That's what God would have you to consider. That's what God would have you to think about. What are you doing to other people? What harm are you doing to others? We are as much bound to the duty of justice as they, and they as much entitled to the benefit of it as we. We must, in our dealings with men, suppose ourselves in the same particular case and circumstances with those we have to do with and deal accordingly. If I were making such a one's bargain, laboring under such a one's infirmity and affection, how would I desire and expect to be treated? Thus the spirit of righteousness is given in two simple commandments by our Lord. The whole of all godliness and righteousness to be found in those two commandments. Love the Lord the God with all your heart and thy neighbor as thyself. Now this was first brought to mankind's stark attention in the giving of the Ten Commandments by Moses. Those Ten Commandments are ten moral commandments that are found in those two commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. The law of Christ is simply the embracing of the law of God. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, edification is a growth in morality, in righteousness. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness. Godliness is living after the manner of God in his principles and precepts that are taught by the law of Christ and the law of the Father. He is proud knowing nothing but dying about questions and strifes of words. Wherefore cometh envy, strife, rallying, evil surmisings, perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. You see, selfishness and covetousness, which we'll come to in the end, desires a gain, and the heart in its covetousness deceives itself that as it acquires some gain, it thinks that it is living in godliness when it more likely is living in wickedness. And you're told to withdraw yourself. Withdraw yourself from such people. Now why should you withdraw yourself? So that you don't become corrupted with them. Seek them to come with you to church, but don't you go to the world and the devil with them. The first commandment teaches us that godly love and righteousness is loyal. Loyalty is something that is going to be in short supply. In the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. They're going to be heady and high-minded. They're going to be traitors. And of course, we're seeing this take place in the earth today greatly. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which you have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Since God is loyal to his people, God's expectation is for his people to be loyal to him. Greater love hath no man than this, the man laid down his life for his friends. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I give my life for the sheep. And he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. This is the character of God. This is the righteousness of God. This is the spirit of God. And loyalty, that's the perfect description of godly love and godliness. 
Godliness is loyal. Love is true and single-minded. It is not fickle. If you truly love God, you will not show love toward any other deity. If you really love the Lord your God, you'll be loyal to him. God is loyal to us. Who does not desire and seek the loyalty of others to themselves? Marriage today in America is suffering tremendously. God said simply this, marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge, people without loyalty. Let your conversation be without covetousness. That's the wanton desire of something that you cannot obtain lawfully and legally. And be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man should do unto me. Yes, it's absolutely true. If you're truly born again, if you've truly repented of your sins, if you truly trust Christ, and he's forgiven you, and the circumcision without hands was performed on you, and Christ is in you, the hope of glory, you cannot lose your soul no matter what you do, but that's not a license to sin. Quite on the contrary, that's an opportunity for godliness. That's an opportunity to learn to do right. That's an opportunity for edification. That's an opportunity to learn to deny yourself and love God with your whole heart, mind, body, and soul. You cannot have a true relationship with God or man without loyalty. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel, it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Probably the greatest expense in life outside of your funeral is a divorce. When two people break their vow of loyalty, what God has joined together, and let not man put asunder, there's few things in life that have a greater cost or penalty than divorce. True loyalty is found in the character of Jesus Christ, the righteous. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bad and defiled. Notice he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now the second commandment teaches us that godly love is also faithful. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Faithfulness. Thou shalt not make on thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or is in earth beneath or is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The true and living God is a spirit. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It is an eternal spirit that's created the universe, that brings to fruitation all life, that will bring all men into judgment. This is the true God. He is not an image that's made like anything. And look at the foolishness of man and the self-justification of man. Oh, people always like to blame God for their sin. Moses had gone up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. Aaron was down with the people and their heart went astray from God. So they took all the gold and they molded it down and they formed a calf. Do you know what he told Moses? He said, well, we just threw the gold in there and this thing just popped up. God did it. <laughs> That's the biggest joke in the world until Judgment Day. God said I could. God! Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. I was walking along the street, and then I saw this money on the ground, and I picked it up, and I realized God wanted me to have it, or God wouldn't have allowed it to be there. 
if you know who the owner thereof is, you have a moral obligation to take it back to him. Wouldn't you want somebody to do that to you? Wouldn't you want somebody to have that kind of righteousness? But of course, the problem you have today, love is faithful and devoted to its object and it obeys in truth. But you have today that most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. How faithful are you? When you are in a position of advantage and you can take advantage of somebody, will you do them right the way you would have wanted it done to you? Or will you do them evil and take gain? We live in a society today that a lot of people are causing a lot of pain to a lot of other people. And they just don't think a thing of it. They'll proclaim their own goodness. Uh, word is, a man's got to make a living. No, you don't. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things should be added unto you. God says, you do right. I'll take care of you. You'll get your living. Do you believe that? I don't think most people do. I don't think a lot of Christians do. That's what God says. True faithfulness is a character of the spirit of Jesus Christ, the righteous. It's very easy to talk the talk of a Christian. But few today walk the walk of a Christian. That's led in the spirit of righteousness. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know what the flesh lusts for? It lusts for some gain. It lusts for an affair. It lusts for things. It lusts for glory. The flesh lusts for things, glory, and affairs. But you're told to walk in the Spirit. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill it. The walk of the Spirit is a walk in the righteousness of God. Do you talk the talk or walk the walk? Thou that sayest a man should not steal, doth thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not lie, doth thou lie? However true faithfulness is a character of the spirit of Jesus Christ, the righteous. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless on the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Most people, even most Christians, do not really comprehend God's eternal security in Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is, when you repent of your sins and you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you have all your sins forgiven, past sins, present sins, and future sins, in justice, if you sin again, you really deserve to still go to hell. It's not that you are being allowed to get away with sin. It's God's character when God vows a vow and God pays the penalty for all the sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins. God's paid the price in full. It's God's character that keeps you, not your lack of character that gives you the liberty to continue being wicked. We have a demented spirit in the church today. Well, I just can, I got liberty. You got liberty because of God's character. God never gave you a license to sin. He gave you a license to get out of hell. By paying the penalty of all our sins with his own blood. And it's not his will or desire that we should stay in that wickedness, but that we should live on to him in godliness. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The third commandment teaches us that godly love is reverent. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. That means just to use God's name in an empty 
way. Because it's a holy name. It's a name that has power, let alone to use it as a cursing or as a defiling, a dementing. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If you truly love God, you will not curse his name or use it with disrespect. God's holy. He sent redemption unto his people. He hath commanded his covenant forever. Holy and reverend is his name. The fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Now, if you're saved, you should stop seeking the praise of men and start seeking the praise of God. Because the praise of men ends when their speech ends, and the praise of God endureth forever. If you love God, you'll seek to walk in reverence to his word and his spirit. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia. You know what Philadelphia means? It means brotherly love. These things saith he that is holy. That's God. He that is true. That's God. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. You know what gave them their little strength? And has kept my word, and has not denied my name. You know what the name of Jesus is? Jehovah saves. You know what God's word is? It's found throughout the Holy Bible. It's God's word revealing the truth of God and God's holiness. You can see it all in doing unto God and others what you would have God and others do unto you. So simple. You can see it in the first ten commandments of holiness and righteousness. The fourth commandment teaches us that godly love is holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's so hard to get people to come to church today. Now we go out and we witness and we lead people in sinners' prayers. And I don't know if they get saved or not. God knows. My job is to give them the truth. My God, job is to give them the opportunity. My God, job is to try to bring them to Christ. But then they're too lazy, too non-caring, too indifferent, too self-centered, too engrossed in sin to come to church. They've got excuses. People love to justify themselves. But God says, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy maidservant, nor thy, excuse me, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. You need to have a day for God. You got six days for the world. God is certainly generous. He's looking for one day for your fellowship with him and for your family. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. Your closest neighbor is your family. Godly love sets itself aside for pure and uncompromising devotion. To the chief musician, Mishael, for the son of Korah, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. If you're in the spirit, your soul will pant after God. If your soul is not panting after God, as the heart panteth after the water brooks, you're certainly not walking in the spirit. You need to be aware of it and turn at the reproof. You need edification. You need to walk into the spirit. God needs to be the center of your life. God needs to be what your heart is set upon. Love recognizes the priority of worship. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. 
Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. When you come to a church, you should be coming to worship God in the beauty of holiness. In a church, you should learn to be concerned for others and how you treat others and how to respect God and the things of God and how to get God as the center of your life so that you can fill it with edification in righteousness. Most Christians know the book of Job was written to answer the question, why do the righteous suffer? But only one other person that I know has ever understood that the opportunity of righteousness and the privilege of holiness is fully sufficient for our suffering unjustly. That I may know him, Paul said, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Now, what's unique about the fellowship of the suffering of Jesus Christ is that all his suffering was unjustifiable. For he knew no sin. He did no sin. He committed no sin. He walked in the law of righteousness and he obeyed the letter of the law of holiness in all of his life. Therefore, there was no need for him to be smitten, save to be smitten for us. So Paul wanted to know the fellowship of his sufferings, to do righteousness and receive grief for it, that he might be glad and learn it was good that he should be afflicted so that he'd understand God's righteousness. You know, getting hurt if you're attentive to the Spirit, suffering the pain unjustly helps produce within the soul a desire not to inflict such pain on another carelessly, wantonly, selfishly. I learned that by going to my father's funeral as a young boy at 16. Now we're sensitive to ourselves and here my father has died and I'm 16 years of age and my world is torn upside down. People come to the funeral. I don't even know why they bothered to come. They could care less. They came and they're telling jokes and they're talking about things and I'm sitting there crying and hurting and suffering. Now some folks came in with compassion and a hug and did the right thing and words of encouragement and words of comfort. But others were there for the only reason I could think of to torment and taunt me. I know that wasn't their preconceived motive, but that's what they ended up doing. I still remember, I'm 62 years of age, going back to I'm 16, the haunting laugh of this woman. <laughs> She's, it's like, lady, it's a funeral shouldn't be telling dirty jokes. So when I go to a funeral, I go with words of comfort. I go with a hug of affection. I go with compassion. And I behave myself appropriately in another person's sorrow. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. As Paul became aware of his sufferings, Paul became sensitive to the sufferings of others. It will work for you that you might have compassion and not this wicked empathy. Mankind has developed a word for sitting around and telling yourself you feel somebody else's pain when you don't even care to go over 
and comfort. God said we are to have compassion on our fellow man. And when the Samaritan saw the man in need, he was moved with compassion and he did godliness to relieve his affliction. Perhaps he suffered in unrighteousness and became compassionate. Truthfully, the only time that a mortal sinful man may be like God is when he suffers unjustly for the Lord's sake in his service. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Now concern our relationship with others. The fifth commandment teaches us that godly love is respectful and our whole culture, society, and the world has a diminishing respect for authorities. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. It is shocking to me how many Christians today think they are spiritual when they are in direct violation of the spirit of holiness found in the commandments of godliness, righteousness, and the holiness of God. Christians have no respect for godly authorities, let alone other authorities. A pastor or teacher is somebody to be abused Parents are to be undermined and legal authorities are disrespected. We live in an untoward generation. The commandment of God is honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not revile the gods, nor curse the ruler of thy people. In my younger days, I erred a few times and the Lord spoke to me. I don't make jokes out of the presidents and the leaders of our people anymore, no matter how strongly I disagree with them. I may disagree with my president 100% almost do but I'm not to revile him nor am I to curse him he is an authority for better or for worse and for his office sake he deserves my respect and your respect no matter how strongly you disagree with him but then what untoward generation that has no respect for its own parents is going to have any respect for any authority. Respect and respectfulness to authorities, godly and ungodly, is very rare in these days that have come upon us. In fact, thou citizen speakest against thy brother, thou slanderest thy own mother's son, these things thou hast done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thy eyes. God's going to be reproving a lot of his Christians at the judgment seat of Christ. So why is that? They don't understand a godly walk in the Spirit is clean and holy and righteous. Very easy to determine. Whatsoever you would that men should do on you. Do you like people to say bad things about you? Do you like people to defame your character? Do you like to be having your name slandered all over the place? Then don't do it to somebody else. Godly love is protective. Thou shalt not kill. Christian, godly love does not slaughter other people. It protects them. 
It believes every life is sacred and that everyone is created in the image of God. It does not slander or undermine others in their righteous and just cause. However, it's very easy to see the spirit of godliness and the spirit of ungodliness in the destructive acts of wicked men. It's an angry man that causes divisions. It's a murderous man that divides and kills. You have your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and bold not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. But men can justify themselves but not before God. They can only justify themselves in the blindness and ignorance of other wicked men. For those who see the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, conduct is self-evident. Godly love is pure. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You can commit sexual and sensual adultery you can commit spiritual adultery a lot of God's people are adultering God every day spiritually God would have us to walk in the spirit God would have us to walk in the truth live the truth preach the truth proclaim the truth be the truth and most of us are living a lie God would not have us to be hypocrites and he gives us grace because of the weakness of our flesh. But many Christians today have turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. And that is a hideous crime. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Love does not defile other people. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul on the vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. You see, the God that saved you is a holy God. The God that saved you is a benevolent God. The God that is your God is righteous. Seeing that ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which live in the body forever. If you're in the Spirit, you do not hurt the one you love. If you truly love your brother, you will do him good. When we hurt others, we hurt because of our lust and our greed and our selfishness and our own desires. The world wrote a song years ago, you only hurt the one you love. That is the way of the world. That's not a walk in the spirit. Love lives to exalt that which is holy, that which is good and virtuous. Thou shall not steal. Love doesn't take something that belongs to someone else. That's greed. That's selfishness. That's a heinous, wicked heart that takes something that belongs to someone else. There's just no excuse for it. But people make excuses all the time. 
When unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and cast my words behind thee. So, in the pulpits, when righteousness was preached, a hideous and a heinous spirit cried, Legalism, legalism. Well, if you're saved and you're born again, you ought to get legal with God. You ought to get right with God and walk in the spirit of righteousness. Because that spirit is a demonic spirit right out of the pit of hell to induce you to wickedness rather than the edification of godliness and holiness. Seeing thou hatest instruction and cast my words behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partakers with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thy own mother's son. The law had a great cure for thieves in the Old Testament. It's called restitution. And with that, if one stole a sheep, we call that petty theft, then they were required to return four sheep for the one that was stole to make restitution. But if they took an ox, which we'd call grand theft, it required a restitution of five ox for one. Now this was a very good thing because it caused honest men to prosper and wicked men to go bankrupt. And it really put a dent in covetousness. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. You know, the silence of God is deafening. God is watching. God is remembering. It is appointed on a man once to die, and after this the judgment, and then God will speak. Who shall abide the day of his coming? Thou thoughtest I was altogether such a one as thyself, but I will reprove thee. God isn't like you. He's holy. He's just. He's pure. That's why he's endured from eternity to eternity. Because he cannot change. He's incorruptible. He's not anything like us in our flesh. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thy eyes. He will. You're saved, it's the judgment seat of Christ. Thank God that you're only going to lose a fortune of rewards and not your soul. But if you're lost, it's the great white throne judgment and you will be cast in a lake of fire where you will have to abandon all hope for all time because you've offended an eternal God and you have an eternal banishment. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. You know, godly love gives rather than takes. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it was more blessed to give than to receive. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God is the greatest giver ever. Godly love is truthful. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Godly love doesn't lie. It doesn't give false testimony. Every time a lie is given and a lie lives, truth dies. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. And 
And lastly, godly love is content. Godly love has peace and it has joy because it discovered righteousness. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. To desire something inordinately, desirous, excessively eager to obtain and possess, directed to money or goods, persons or things, places or positions. To desire that which is unlawful to obtain or possess in a very bad sense. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. The depth of covetousness is that it resides in the soul of men. From within out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Through covetousness, a man sees only what he wants rather than the needs of his soul. So it blinds his eyes of his understanding and closes his ears to the hearing of God's truth and claims upon him his life and his soul. And the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches and the loss of other things enter in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Through self-interest, self-will, man's ears are closed to the precepts and commandments of the word of God that God has given for the good of mankind and for his own glory. Instead of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, man runs greedily after the world, grasping and loving the things of the world. He heeds not the warnings of God's word which are given to protect him and help him. So instead of the greatness, uh, greatest good, God, he chooses the greatest evil, sin, at his own peril. As he blindly pursues his own depraved desires, he says in his soul, I must have my way. I'll have that woman or that man. If I have to break up their marriage to get them, I'll have that position if I have to kill someone to get it or destroy their reputation. I'll have my, if I, or to undermine them. I'll have my pleasure and my drink, my money, my home, my job, my good times in life, in my way, no matter what the consequences. All right. Hell and destruction are never full. This is the evil, this is the essence of evil. My friend, and this is the heart of every man or woman outside of Jesus Christ that's not walking in the spirit of truth and holiness. For all the laws are filled in one word, even this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say that walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. For your edification, walk in the spirit. There are a lot of saved Christians that don't even have a clue, a desire, or an interest to seek a walk in the spirit. Such a shame. God paid such a price. But God's character is shown in that he will never leave nor forsake thee. But it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. And knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Be edified. Walk in the spirit. Seek first the kingdom of God. All the things you need will be added to you. God will take care of you. You take care of doing right by God and doing right by your fellow man. Friend, come to Calvary. Come and we'll teach you and give you edification in walking in spirit and truth. We have no agendas but the glorification of God Almighty.
God is good. God is holy. God is perfect. God is just. And God should be glorified. Man should obey and follow him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.